Hey everyone, this is Kenji. Uh, today we're gonna make some kima mutter. Um, I've heard it called kima mutter or mutter kima. I'm not really sure which is correct, but I think it doesn't really mutter. Um, so this is ground meat, um, ground meat and peas, a uh, dish from the Indian subcontinent. It's actually like from way back in the 16th century, or so around then, like the the Mughal Empire. This was a, a dish from the Mughal Empire. Oh, so in here I've got cumin seeds, uh, coriander seeds, and black cardamom. Um, I'm grinding them up in the mortar and pestle. You can use pre-ground if you want. Um, I just happen to have these spices, so I'm grinding them up. Uh, the difference between pre-ground and grinding yourself is that generally when you grind yourself, um, it, it, it'll have more flavor because whole spices don't lose their flavor as fast as pre-ground spices do. Um, and so, you know, the, the reason is because there, there are volatiles in spices that, um, uh, break down um, and jump off the spice over time uh, and the more surface area you have exposed to the air the faster that breaks down and the faster the flavor leaves so ground spices just tend to lose their flavor faster than uh, whole spices do um, so I buy most of my spices whole in bulk uh, from the Indian market generally um, or online uh, and I go from there so this dish, um, you can make it with any kind of minced meat you want, really, but um, I just happen to have beef and pork, so very, two very sort of non-traditional options here, but it's what I had. Um, more common would be goat or lamb, um, but again, you can do with that whatever you want. Turkey, you can do chicken, you can do beef, you can do pork. What we're doing is we're gonna add actually some water to the ground meat, which seems like a weird thing to do. Um, but the reason you do this is because it helps you cook the meat and get a sort of smooth consistency. Um, generally, with this dish, you don't want it to have sort of chunks um, of meat that's stuck together. Uh, you really want the meat to have sort of a smooth, almost sauce-like consistency. Um, this is actually a technique I first became aware of when I was um, researching um, chili for hot dogs you know the, the kind of so chili that you like saucy chili that you put on hot dogs um greek chili sometimes it's called if you're from cincinnati um or uh, from cincinnati i don't know i don't remember somewhere there, there's areas where they call it greek chili um <clears throat> but it's a sort of saucy hot dog chili um and so i found a lot of recipes that called for adding ground meat directly to water um, and then bringing it to a simmer so that you, while, while sort of stirring it so that you get a really smooth sauce-like consistency. And then, to my surprise, turns out that that is a very common technique for kima mutter as well. So, um, typically you would use uh, clarified butter for this. I'm not gonna clarify my butter. Um, I'm just gonna use straight up butter. Um, I, don't, I don't really see a reason to clarify your butter, my butter, ghee, make ghee for this. Um, so I don't. Um, in fact, very frequently when a recipe tells me to clarify butter, I just ignore it. Um, the only times you really need it are if you're like searing high heat and you don't want any kind of browned milk solids, uh, then you can clarify your butter, but um, in this case we're sort of going to be sauteing some spices uh, as well as some other things. So we got our meat there, let's save these little chunks of ginger, so I'm going to do about, about this much ginger. Just take off the skin. You can use a spoon also to, to scrape off the skin. I'm just doing it with a knife. This knife is actually probably the oldest knife in my collection. This is a uh, uh, a Wusthof paring, paring knife. Um, oh, you know what? Actually, it's not the oldest knife in my collection. It is it's definitely one of the oldest knives, but um, the oldest knife in my collection was a Wusthof paring knife. That was one of the first knives I ever bought myself because I, you know, I, I could barely afford it and paring knives are relatively expensive. Um, it, it was one of the oldest, it was one of the first knives I ever got, um, but like all paring knives do, it got lost slash stolen slash misplaced somewhere um, in a restaurant I was working at. Um, I've, I've never known a line cook who's managed to keep their paring knife through their whole career, um, so I replaced that. So this is not, this is the replacement knife, which is not the oldest knife in my collection. So a little brown butter, I don't mind those brown solids in a dish like this. Let that butter go, and now we're gonna add to it some star anise, one pod, uh, a couple bay leaves, half a cinnamon stick, and some cloves. Um, these are the spices that are kind of, well the star anise, the cinnamon, and the cloves are kind of very powerful spices that um, I don't want to add ground because they would uh, they would sort of overwhelm all the other flavors in here, um, but uh, they will sort of impart their perfume to the butter. 
Um, and then we can sort of take, either take them out or just tell, you know, I'll just tell Audrey and Alicia to not eat them if they happen to get them in their bowl. Um, and the bay leaves, uh, the bay leaves I just do whole because they uh, don't really work out um, ground. I suppose they do. I have seen some dishes where you grind up bay leaves, but um, they definitely can't grind them in the uh, mortar and pestle very easily. Um, so I'm going to leave them in whole so that we can just avoid them when we're eating later. Um, and yes, bay leaves do add flavor to a dish. Um, that's a very common question I get on the internet, like, what's the point of bay leaves? Um, do they really add anything to a dish? They do. Um, you know, it's not one of those flavors that when you taste a dish, you're like, ooh, that's bay leaf. But if it wasn't there, um, you would notice that there's a little bit less complexity, a little bit. So bay, bay leaves, the flavor, main flavor of them is sort of like a menthol-y eucalyptus type aroma. Um, and so, you know, so, some bay leaves, you know, fresh bay leaves, especially California bay, tend to have a lot more of that aroma going on um, than dried Turkish bay leaves, or these ones are Indian bay leaves, um, which have a uh, more subtle, subtle flavor and less of that mentholiness. Um, but if you taste something made with bay leaves side by side with something made without, you definitely notice that the one with bay leaves has sort of an added dimension to it. Um, so yes, bay leaves do offer something. Um, so we're going to make a garlic and ginger paste here in the mortar and pestle. Garlic ginger paste is like a very sort of, it's the start to many, many a curry. Garlic, ginger, and onions, which is what we're going to do here. Actually, let me get the onion going first, because that's going to take a little bit longer than the garlic ginger paste will. By the way, as far as spices go on here, um, if you look up recipes for kima mutter, um, they, the spicing varies sort of wildly, you know, as, as with in most curries, the spicing will vary wildly and it, um, you know, so depending on who you ask, it'll have a different less list of spices to use. Um, you know, with, with some of the same sort of basic staples. So always cumin, coriander, um, garlic and ginger. Um, but as far as like a lot of the other things go, um, it's largely option, you know, largely optional or up to your own personal taste. Uh, as long as you're not throwing in something crazy there, like... I don't know, like mango powder you wouldn't want to put in a dish like this. Um, but, you know, you could use fenugreek. You could use, if you just want to go straight up, like a jar of um, garam masala or like, something like this, like a jar of madras curry powder, um, you, can use, you can use that, right? And it'll taste, if it tastes good to you, it's fine. Um, you know, and sometimes I do do that if I'm feeling like I don't want to bust out all my real spices. I'll go ahead and I'll um, just use a spice blend. In fact, on the side here, I'm going to make a, um, a separate dish. Um, I had these potatoes uh, left over from... I, I boiled a bunch of potatoes, fingerling potatoes, or small new potatoes, that we then grilled into a potato salad. Um, I can put a link for uh, my grilled potato salad recipe in the description below. We grilled them for a potato salad the other night, and I had a bunch left over that were parboiled. So today I'm going to stir-fry them with... Um, uh, what I've got is this blend of... Um, <clears throat> cumin and fried cumin and mustard seeds that have been mixed with uh, madras curry powder and that's the same spice blend that we use for the curry first in our um, at my restaurant which is a very you know, traditional German curry first uh, is sort of like a, you know, a curry spiced ketchup um, on french fries and um, and a sausage uh, what we do is we make a sort of a, a blackened ginger um, curry sauce uh, that's sort of ketchupy in appearance, um, but is much sort of more complex in flavor, a little more bitter, more fresh spices. Um, <clears throat> and then we dust it all with that fried uh, that fried cumin, uh, black mustard seed, and uh, and cilantro mixture. That's what we dust it all with. I think it's very good. All right, so we're gonna let that fry for a little bit. And now we're gonna pound this into a paste. Let's add a little, add some salt to our onions. That'll help them cook a little faster and we'll add some salt to our paste here. Salt is kind of a magic ingredient. So when you're, when you're pounding things like this, it kind of acts as an abrasive. So it helps 
break down cells. Um, it also, through osmosis, draws moisture out of cells. Um, so it helps basically the vegetables break down much more easily. Uh, the, the plant cells break down more easily. And when you're frying, um, it does a similar thing. It pulls liquid out from inside the cells, which causes them to sort of collapse, um, which makes them fry a little faster. Mm, that spices smell really good. Oh, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna be taking a few photographs because this is actually a recipe that's going to appear in my um, my book that I'm working on. I'm working on a book on cooking in a wok. Um, and this recipe will appear in there. Um, and I haven't taken the photographs for it yet, so. Um, so I got this kind of old looking Serrano chili that I'm also gonna use. And actually I might, my daughter's, daughter's generally okay with heat, but I know this guy from a taco video that I made the other night. Um, I know this guy's really spicy, so I'm gonna give rid of some of the seeds. Um, as you probably know, most of the spice, the capsaicin, um, that, the oil that, that triggers our, um, that pain reaction, the hot food pain reaction on our tongue. Um, <coughs> yeah, this one is, I can feel it in my throat already just through the air. Um, most of that capsaicin is located in the ribs and the seeds. So if you get rid of them, your chili will be less spicy. Uh, people ask me about knives. I, you know, I'll just start talking about my equipment as I go through. This particular knife I really enjoy. It is um, Can Can Core is the um, is the brand. It's a 67 layer Damascus steel. Um, it is a relatively small new knife company, uh, maybe a couple years old. Um, it is the knife that we give to all of our cooks after they um, hit their one year anniversary at our restaurant at my restaurant. Um, and. Uh, I don't know the owner personally. This is not product placement or an ad, by the way. I don't know the owner of the company personally, but um, I, uh, I have interacted with him, with him online just because he's seen me use his knives. Um, and we've talked about his knives and he is a highly dedicated, uh, lovely guy. Um, and I would very strongly recommend the knives, um, especially because I think from all the testimonials from other people I've heard and my own experience um, dealing with him, uh, the customer care of the brand is, is, is really great as well. Um, he kind of personally interacts with everybody who buys his knife, which is uh, rare these days, you know? So to this, uh, the ground spices, I'm also gonna add maybe a teaspoon or so of turmeric, ground turmeric. Um, and this, which is, uh, I was at the Latin grocer today down the street from me and they, they had this ground uh, chili, California. Um, and I like Chile, California, so I'm just gonna add some of that too. Not what I normally do, but I'm doing it this time. All right, so we're looking for the onion to get nice and dark brown like that. That's looking good. Now I'm gonna add my spice mix, or my uh, chili garlic. Gar sorry, garlic ginger paste. As well as that chili. I hope Alicia is in a heat tolerant mood today. Cause I think this is gonna be pretty spicy. Good. Okay, so that paste is frying. Let me get my, let me get my little photo here. It's 
I'm good. So one of the things that you'll notice um, when you're frying wet ingredients, um, like that chili paste or the onions, um, is that when you first put them in, they kind of steam, you know, and they have this kind of like, a certain noise that they make, like a kind of like a shh sound. And then as the, as the water starts to evaporate off um, and it transitions from steaming to actually frying and crisping um, and browning, you get this sort of more of like a crackly, like the sound of frying. Um, and that's, you know, that's one of those times when you really want to use your ears uh, to tell if something, tell when something is done, is ready for the next step. Um, the other one, and in this case, is a sort of visual cue where when you see the oil kind of start breaking out, I don't know if you can see that, but when you see the oil kind of start breaking out of the uh, of the uh, solids, um, that's a sign that most of your moisture has been evaporated and that you're in sort of frying mode. Um, now that's when I'm going to add my other spices. So to repeat, that was turmeric ground chili, um, in this case just chili uh, California, uh, turmeric, ground chili, ground cardamom, uh, this one I use black cardamom, you can use black or green or a combination, Blanc, ground cardamom, uh, ground coriander, and uh, ground cumin seed. Oh, here's a try tip I have defrosting for another project, for my uh, New York Times article. Um, last week I put out an article in the New York Times that uh, showed you how to basically roast an inexpensive cut of meat um, and then store that roast, uh, the already cut, already cooked roast in the freezer and use it um, to make a whole bunch of different meals later on down the line. Um, so I'm going to be sort of demoing all of those in uh, some upcoming recipes. So keep an eye out for that. All right, so now I'm going to take my tomato. I'm just going to grate it through the large holes of a box grater here. is I think the easiest technique to get um, the flesh out of a tomato when you're making a, a sauce because basically leaves all the skin behind. And it kind of pre-chops the tomato, pre-sauces the tomato for you so you don't, you neither have to so ta ta uh, you neither have to cut it nor peel it or blanch it or anything. Um, super convenient method. And the skin kind of acts as a protective glove for you. See? All done. All right, tomato in there. Mm, that smells great. All right, now finally we're gonna go in with our meat. Meat and water mixture here. Might even need a little more water. Okay, now we're just going to let this kind of simmer down for a while. Take a quick picture. Um, we'll put a lid on it too, because I'm going to jump outside. Let's, let's Now I'm going to run outside and we're going to, uh, I've had the pizza oven preheating so we're going to bake some naan. Right, now the rest of this butter I will add to my rice. This is supposedly Basmati rice. Um, Lundberg, the brand, uh, I think they're from North Carolina. Um, this is supposedly Basmati rice, but it does not look like any Basmati rice I've ever had. Um, this looks just sort of like a regular old Carolina um, medium grain. Well, 
long grain rice. That's what it tastes like also. Definitely doesn't have any of that kind of aged basmati flavor. And has much shorter grains than most basmati. That said, it's still gonna taste good. Hmm. Actually not too spicy. Plenty of flavor. And take our cilantro. Turn, so you throw it down, wipe, throw it down. This is what you do if you don't wanna use paper towels to dry your herbs or a salad spinner. You know, when you just have a small amount of herbs like that sitting in water, either because you rinse them or because you want to fresh them up. Pick them up and slam them down. I will do all these dishes later. Actually, tonight might be Audrey's turn to do the dishes. So Audrey will probably do the dishes later. I know people talk about, like I've heard, often heard commenters say, oh, you have so many dishes to do. It's like, it's not really that many. And most of them are relatively clean. You know, it's like, most of them are just a real quick, easy, easy job to do. Um, I mean, I could blow through those dishes in five minutes. Audrey will probably take four minutes to do them. Um, if you can't really devote four minutes to cleaning up after yourself after dinner, then I don't know. I say you deserve what you eat. Let's get this into a bowl. I got these beautiful little copper, copper and steel serving bowls that I bought at an Indian market. I think they're lovely. I was like, I'm, I'm a kind of, I'm a, I'm an appreciator and a collector of serviceware. Um, and I really, like, I really enjoy a nice looking plate. All right, starting to get nice and rich here. At the very end, we're gonna shake in just a touch of um, garam masala, just store-bought garam masala. So the, the point of this garam masala at the end is so what, what you'll often find with many curries and you know di cuisines that rely on a lot of dry spices um, is that you'll add the spices in sort of multiple phases. So you might fry some, bloom it in the oil at the beginning, which is what I did here. You, you saw me add the spices and bloom them in the oil, um, or in the butter at least. And what that does is it um, you know it extracts some of the sort of flavor, the fat soluble flavor compounds from there. Um, the high heat of the fat. Um, we know that it was high heat because it was not the wa the onions and garlic and, ch and uh, chilies and ginger were not steaming anymore. They were sizzling, which means that the oil was getting up there above, you know, well above the boiling point of water and probably closer to more like 300, 350 degrees. Um, so at that temperature, you're also going to be uh, triggering chemical reactions that are going to add complexity. Um, and when I say add complexity, I mean like literal measurable complexity. You're taking a certain set of chemical compounds, you're applying heat to them, uh, and then it triggers this cascade of reactions that where you end up with many, many more new compounds. Um, it's sort of, you can sort of think of it as, um, it's like if I have a, uh, a Lego spaceship, um, which is my main spice, right? My, my cardamom is a Lego spaceship. And then uh, heat is like um, my toddler coming through and wrecking it. Uh, and then what she does then after that is she reassembles it into 50 different new smaller things that, um, you know, so, so basically you end up with, you, you start out with one big thing and it, re and it gets reassembled into many, many different smaller things um, by the three-year-old toddler that is heat. <clears throat> um, that's the same, you know, same thing that happens with like uh, caramelization, um, the Maillard reaction, you know, the browning reaction. Anytime, hmm, yeah, all right. Anytime you're heating food, um, that's what's going on. So those are just uh, fresh, fresh raw peas that are from the shell, uh, just out of the shell. Um, you can use you can use uh, frozen peas. Frozen peas work great for this. Um, peas are one of those vegetables that are almost better frozen um, because unless you can get your fresh peas really really fresh like straight from the farmers market and you use them using them up quickly um, like these came from the farmers market two days ago unless you're using them real quickly um, they will start to get super starchy and lose their sweetness whereas frozen peas are frozen um, while they're sort of at peak sweetness uh, which is why frozen peas tend to be sweeter and more flavorful frequently than uh, fresh peas do 
unless you can get really good fresh peas. But yeah, so frozen peas, if you're gonna, fro if you're gonna use frozen peas, um, put them in a strainer and run them under hot water just to defrost them before you add them in here, or don't, you know, just throw them in frozen and let it, give it, you know, a few minutes and they'll defrost just fine. Or microwave them, any number of ways you can, any number of ways you can incorporate them. Oh, that last thing I was gonna do. Let's do, um, Potatoes, there's potatoes. So I'm gonna actually I'm gonna transfer this out to uh, another pot so that I can fry my potatoes in here. I almost forgot about them. This is a carbon steel wok. You care for it basically the same way you would treat cast iron, so don't leave it wet. Um, but you can always uh, you can always feel free to wash it with soap and water. Um, that's not going to strip the seasoning. There's my garam masala going in. Um, the only thing you don't want to do is leave it sitting around wet because that might cause it to uh, cause it to rust. All right, so these are simply potatoes that have been parboiled whole and then. Uh, Cut into quarters. So parboiled in salted water. Mmm, those are good. Good, good, good peas. Um, you could do could do butter here. I'm just gonna use olive oil because I don't want to melt any more butter. So we're gonna take our parboiled potatoes and fry just a bit. You can let them get as crispy or not as you want. Um, for this particular dish, I don't think they really have to be super crispy per se. Um, you know, I kind of just like them soft and coated in a flavorful oil or flavorful fat. So we're gonna go in there with these. So the way you can make this stuff is you take um, whole cumin seeds, whole black mustard seeds, um, and you just fry them, in, uh, fry them in oil until they start to kind of butter and pop. Um, and then take it out, drain the oil off them on paper towels. Um, and then cool it down. And then toss it with some uh, curry powder. And I just use Madras style, store bought Madras style curry powder. All right. Uh, Audrey, dinner in like two minutes. Shovel. There. All right. These potatoes, dip them in yogurt. I think that's delicious. Or squeeze a little citrus on top of them. I definitely want to get all the pan crunchies out. A serving spoon? No, that's just a big spoon. Nope, we're gonna use it as a serving spoon. I like to throw some of the whole spices in there just to remind people that they're there. 
to show people, hey, look what, look at the work that went into this. Look at the work. Something I learned in high school, always show your work. Especially in cooking, because the more work people think was done to something, the more, um, the more likely they are to like it. It's a, it's a pro tip. In fact, the more work you can get someone to do in a recipe, the more likely they are to think it's great themselves. That's why like, I have a chili recipe that has like 40 ingredients and takes seven days to do. It's, just, it's, all a, it's like, a, like Stockholm Syndrome. You're, you've been kidnapped by the recipe. Let's eat. Well, let me grab a little fork so I can do my customary by the window taste. Reminds me of my mother's. <laughs> this reminds me of my mother's mother. Mm, I love those. All right, guys, here you go. Sit. Good girl. All right. See you later. Dinner time. <laughs>